Great to be here with you. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We've made it now to the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. What an awesome journey uh, it has been. And, and be- believe it or not, man, we're just getting started here. Uh, I was reading a story uh, just this week uh, uh, about, uh, that Billy Graham tells about Albert Einstein uh, in the midst of a very busy speaking tour. Mr. Einstein, pretty smart guy, right? Well, he had boarded a train And when the conductor came down the aisle to punch his ticket, he found Mr. Einstein just buried in his work, preoccupied with his work. And uh, so he uh, uh, evidently couldn't find his ticket, and and he goes down to to punch his ticket, and he's just rummaging through his pockets, you know, where's my ticket, and so forth. And, And you just know, I mean, if that was one of us, you're Einstein, I would have looked at the conductor and said, look... Einstein here, all right? You know, you ought to pay me to be on this train. Sad part is, you know, one day your kids are going to look at one of their dumb friends and say, okay, Einstein, and, you know, that's sort of my legacy. I just did forget about uh, E equals MC squared, right? Now, if you were the conductor, if I were, I mean, how do you pass that one up? So you've just boarded the train, and already you've lost your ticket, Einstein, right? <laughs> Uh, but the conductor, he had the better part of valor, and he said, it's all right, Mr. Einstein, we, we know who you are. I, I'm sure you paid for your ticket. I, I can clearly see that you're preoccupied with your work. And, and he walked on down the aisle, uh, and he began to uh, punch other tickets. And as he, as he is about to move to the next car, he looks back and sees Einstein on his hands and knees, you know, just rummaging for his ticket under the seat. And so he walks back there and he says, no, really, sir, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We know who you are. And Einstein replied and said, good man, I, I too know who I am. What I do not know is where I'm going. And so to pick up on with what we left with last week, I'm coming under great conviction in these recent days that, that because of our own set of, of preoccupations, that, that we too don't have a real handle on just where it is we are going, that, that if we could somehow um, cultivate a, a present appreciation, and, and by faith, a, a present appropriation, really, of, of, of where God is telling us over and over and over in the Word of God that this is all going, if we could do that, we would live differently. We, we just would. Now, I'm not saying that we check out of the present, all right? We, we need to be engaged in that, and, and we'll see that this morning in the text. But what I am saying is if we could just find a way to raise the bar a little bit on how often we think about eternity, I, I'm telling you we would be the richer for it. Now, you know this, right? That week before you're headed out on this glorious vacation, right? You've planned out this glorious vacation all year long, this beautiful beachfront resort. And then finally, you're at the very week in front of that week. Guess what? You can put up with a lot of garbage that week, can't you? A lot of garbage you could put up with that week that you probably wouldn't do so well handling in other weeks. Understand that as Christians, this book here tells us that we have a holiday at the sea in front of us that will never, ever end. Again, in which every chapter is better than the one before. There will be no going back to the office on Monday. Do do we understand that? And so listen, the degree to which we appreciate and appropriate the reality of of where God is taking us, that is going to have an impact upon how we live our lives presently, the decisions we make, the responses that are brought forth, the, the patience that we exhibit. And so here now, as we're kind of in this 
discipleship intensive section for the next several chapters, really, here in Luke's gospel. Uh, Christ is going to be beginning to shift into heavy teaching gear here. We, as a family of believers, are going to continue to try and, and frame all of this in the purpose for which it is intended to bring us to glory to develop us and mature us for what is to come, to to posture us in the best possible way, uh, to posture in the best possible way the landscape of our eternal experience. And so again, we've got some very tough stuff coming down the pike here, some very strong teaching from Christ and some very tough text uh, yet this morning. But if we frame this properly, if we as a community... If we can try to continue and encourage one another, remind one another of where this is all going, if we can appropriate that biblical reality that that, that all of this, this tough stuff, this discipleship is intended for our present and particularly eternal glory, if we can do that, that that Christ, having now saved us, desires to now disciple us, if we can get that, our, our attitudes are going to be, bring it. Now again, Where we're at here, you remember, back up in verse 51, Luke told us that that Team Christ here, they have now set upon their final march to Jerusalem. This is the final few months now in the the earthly ministry of Christ. And again, what we're going to discover, we're going to begin to discover a very steep drop and kind of the visible sight miracles. There's going to be a few, uh, but the mother load of, of what we've got for the next 10 chapters is a very teaching intensive section. And and man, I I just love it. There's no other way to say it. So let's get after it now. We go to work in verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now after this, the Lord had appointed 70 others. Some manuscripts have 72 there. Uh, This Greek word here is 70. Uh, It does not take away from um, what is intended in the text. Uh, So after after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord. That word beseech, it means pray earnestly. Just dig in and pray. You might have pray in your translation there. Uh, Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. Now, now notice you don't coerce people to serve, right? Notice we're not coercing here. Uh, You just dig in and pray that the Lord would raise them up. And and that's really what we're doing here. We have some needs, again, particularly in in the nursery for some backup um, for Stacy. But but we're not we're not coercing people. We're not we're just praying that God would raise people up there. So uh, very important to, to see that. Pray that the Lord would send out laborers into his harvest. Verse three, go, behold, I send you. Underline that. I send you. Go, behold, I send you as lambs in the midst of wolves. So several things here. First of all, this, this is a um, different sending than we had back at the cha- uh, top of chapter 9 with the 12. This is a different event. The 12 are, of course, part of this 70, but this is a different event. And by the way, this is only recorded uh, here in Luke's gospel. Uh, symbolically, uh, I think we've got a couple of takeaways with the 70. Uh, first of all, uh, this idea that proclaiming the gospel, that this is not something that is, is just limited uh, it, to the professional realm. All right? Luke is telling his Gentile audience, you don't have to be one of the 12. You don't have to be one of the big 12 to share the gospel. Every follower, every disciple of Christ is called to the proclamation of his kingdom. So so there's an idea here of who it is that is to go forth, and that is all of us. And secondly, there's the idea of who it is broadcast to. In the 70, when you go back to Genesis chapter 10, there you find the table of nations, and there are 70 nations enumerated there. So the idea that, that's being communicated, what, what this is symbolic of is that the gospel is for all people. 
Okay, so the sending of the 70, it is emblematic of all believers proclaiming to all that would hear the proclamation. There, there, does that make sense? There, there's kind of a universality uh, implied, uh, implicit in the text here. All are to proclaim the gospel for the benefit of all. All right, uh, now notice he says there that we're to be sent out as, very interesting, lambs in the midst of wolves. Lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, there's something you don't see every day, right? It's a very rare sight. And the reason that that's a very rare sight is that lambs don't usually last very long in the presence of wolves. They're just there for a few moments, and then uh, there's a pile of bones left there is what you got. So this is not easy work, right? Lambs among wolves. This is not easy. And yet, I had you underline this. Notice he says, I send you. Going out as lambs among wolves, this is an expression of absolute dependence upon Christ. We don't go trusting in our own abilities. We go trusting in the abilities of Christ. If, if Christ is the one that sends me, then Christ is the one that is going to empower me. Christ is the one that is going to be keeping me. And Christ is going to be uh, in charge of this operation, if you will. And so notice here, he's not sending us out as attack sheep, right? He's not sending us out as hunters among wolves, but he is saying we are to be lambs, walking in humility, dependent upon the power of our God. And, and it's really as we do that, that, that the reflection of, of Christ is seen most clearly, right? Humble, dependent. We go forth in humility, we go forth in dependence, and yet yet we go forth in the power of our God. Now, there is one more thing I'd kind of like to tease out of, of this text, and we're going to see it yet emphasized in the text that's coming this morning, and, and that is there's a sense of urgency here, all right? Jesus isn't sending the 70 to go out and sow seed. He is sending the 70 to what? Bring in the harvest, now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. We are constantly sowing seeds by the way that you and I carry ourselves. By our love for one another, will they know we are disciples? John 13, 35. I get that. But contextually, what I want to try and tease out of the text here is I think that we underestimate just how many people are in fact ripe for the harvest. We have adopted in the church today this idea that a super kind of protracted, well-developed relationship must be cultivated and nurtured before we can begin to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And I, I don't so much see that in the New Testament. Now, is it wisdom to cultivate and develop relationships? Does that put you in a better position to, to deliver the gospel? Is an individual likely to be more disposed to receive truth from a person that they've come to know? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I would categorically um, agree with all of that. And yet, over and over through the years, I've seen that as a kind of crutch to shy away from uh, sharing the gospel. I've seen a lot of, of opportunities squandered. I, I've seen a lot of windows shut. Listen, a couple things we need to consider here. Number one, it is God who regenerates the person's spirit, right? We need to understand that. A person's coming to faith is not a function of my skill or, or your impeccable sense of timing, okay? It is God that it regenerates a soul. A human being can't do that. Number two, and this is huge here, tomorrow is a promise to no one but for the child of God. You just do not know how long a person is going to be around. So what am I saying? I, I, I'm saying there, I think there needs to be wisdom. We don't cram this stuff down a person's throat. We need to have a, a humility and a sensitivity and a, and a real discernment there. But we have sacrificed our sense of urgency. 
We have sacrificed our sense of urgency at the altar of thinking we need these long, drawn-out relationships before we can begin to speak forth the truth of the gospel to people. And again, I just don't see that in the New Testament. I'm telling you, there's a lot more receptivity out there than you think. Again, it's God who causes the increase. We're just on the hook to be faithful. And so if I were to offer a a, a kind of paraphrase of this for the days in which we live, I, I might say the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few and slow at the switch. We've lost our sense of urgency, friends. Take that to the Lord in prayer this week and see what he has for you there. All right. So he's taking these 70 guys and he is sending them out to all of the places that he himself is going to stop on his final trip to Jerusalem. These guys, in effect, a cool picture here, these guys are being sent to herald his first coming, even as you and I are now being sent to herald his return. Okay? And we're to do so as lambs among wolves and yet going in his strength and his provision. Now, uh, notice here in verse 4, he begins to give them uh, some insight in how to go forth. We've seen much of this before. Verse 4. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes. And underline this, greet no one on the way. Greet no one along the road. Seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. This would be our equivalent of saying, may God bless you, all right? Uh, Verse 6, if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Uh, Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick. Now, again, this, this, this Greek word, this particular word for heal is therapeo. It's where we get our word therapy from. All right. It speaks of nurturing and kind of nursing back to health here. That This is not, you know, your ear falls off and, and Christ puts it back on you or one of these guys puts it back on you. Uh, and by the way, when we get these guys come back in verse 17, the only healing that is mentioned is a spiritual healing um, spoken of. So a uh, therapeo, therapy, heal those who in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Verse 10, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, uh, go out into its streets and say, in this the part we've seen before as well, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, uh, again, we looked at much of what was here. We looked at much of what is here uh, back in the sending of the 12 at the top of chapter 9. V- very, very similar. In fact, almost identical uh, to what we, we covered. So we won't reiterate all that here. But notice a couple of things. Again, I want to draw your attention to the sense of urgency here. Uh, notice for the disciple, there is to be this sense of urgency. Christ says there at the end of verse 4, greet no one on the way or greet no one along the road. Now, it's Jesus saying when somebody comes up to you, it's talk to the hand. You know, the face isn't listening. You know, just no, bye bye. No, no, that's not what he's saying at all. I understand and I've told you this, uh, we've talked about this a number of times, this was a culture that was given over to hospitality. This was a hospitality-intensive culture, and life was lived at just a, a very different pace than you and I are accustomed to. They were not just consumed with, with efficiency and expediency uh, the way that we are today. Now, now, when you and I say, hey, how you doing? We don't really mean it. I mean, we do not want an answer. We want the other person to say good, and we'll do the same if they ask us, but let's keep moving this ball down the road so we can keep move things moving, right? That ought to make fellowship after church interesting. 
Uh, but that's how we do it in this culture. I mean, that's how you keep moving. That's how we get stuff done. In this culture, a hey, how you doing is going to eat up an entire afternoon, all right? Understand that they were one big family. They were sharing genealogies with each other and, and figuring out, well, well, you know, how do you get back to Abraham? And, and, and you're talking about mom and dad, and you're talking about the aunts and uncles. And, and I don't know if you're, you're the Hills, you're, you're going to talk about Aunt Hill uh, in there somewhere. And and before you know it, it's five o'clock and you've shot down the better part of an afternoon. There was to be a sense within the disciple that time is a precious commodity that, that we don't, we do not have all the time in the world. And again, you and I, we need to understand that, that, that we don't have all all the time in the world. Your heart's going to beat so many times. Your lungs are going to take so many breaths. Your feet are going to take so many steps, and and then you're just going to be done. You're just done. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? (laughs) But every single one of us, we have a tombstone in our future. I don't know about you, but when people finally struggle through the weeds and pull back the moss and get up to my tombstone. I I do not want it to say, well, he made his car payments. You know, we want more than that, don't we? We we want our lives to mean something. So let's pray this week that, that God would so do a work in this faith community that our hearts would desire long to make a difference, that God would would just kind of pull us out of ourselves and and upward into where he's taking this for all of eternity. There is no greater joy to be found than to find yourself swept upward in the work of God and and, in the will of God for your life. There's just not. Secondly, I want you to notice there that he says in uh, verse 10, if they don't want to listen, they don't want to listen. So again, uh, the disciple, while there is to be a degree of urgency, that does not mean we're to cram anything down anybody's throat. You just move on down the road, by the way, where you're going to find a lot more receptivity than you think. Again, we are, we've got to get this. We are not responsible for the increase. We're not responsible to get somebody to sign on some kind of dotted line. We're not responsible for results. We are only on the hook to be faithful. And I think if we could just wrestle that to the ground, there would be a lot more sharing going on in our lives. And of course, what that will produce is a whole lot of joy you wish you would have gotten a hold of earlier. It's how he made you. Go out and do it. Find that joy. Share the gospel. As Kristen alluded to earlier, what what I would like to do, uh, not some big drawn-out production, but I would like to give kind of a a mini workshop on on how we do that because people think, well, all right, well, how how do I share the gospel? How do I do that in my context? Are are, are there some pointers? Are there some techniques? And so I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to equip you. Um, to maybe uh, uh, get a handle on that a little better. So this Saturday at 10 a.m. at the prayer meeting, kind of a a mini workshop, I'm going to try and share uh, how it is we do that and what that looks like. Okay. Well, then he says some very, as we move into verse 12 here, very, very difficult things are going to come out of the mouth of Christ, and, and yet very interesting things, verse 12. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Speaking of the cities that that, that reject the gospel. Now he's going to drill down here, verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now here comes the heavy stuff. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. Ouch! Verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who who sent me. Now, what Christ is doing here, guys, is, is really underscoring that just the serious nature of, of what it is he's sending his disciples to do. 
This is not a trivial subject. Yes, there is tremendous joy to be had as you carry the message of the gospel. Blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news, right? But what ought to really motivate us is is just what it is that is on the line for those to whom we're carrying the message for. I I remember, I was telling these guys in our our pre-service meeting this morning, I remember reading a story uh, a number of years ago that just stuck with me. There was a a, a late 19th century criminal, a guy that was on his way to being executed in London, and there was a a prison chaplain marching right behind him. They're headed to the gallows, and and this prison chaplain is reading out of the Gospel of Mark and and what this hardened criminal uh, sort of felt to be a kind of disinterested and, and a kind of dry tone. And so at one point he turns to the chaplain and says, do, do you really believe what it is you're reading? Well, of course I do. I'm a chaplain. And the guy said, well, if what you're reading is true, if, if even if all of England was covered in broken glass, I would be crawling on hands and knees from coast to coast if I thought even one soul could be saved from the eternal hell here that you're describing. I remember so many years ago coming under great conviction when I heard that story. I remember thinking, how is it that I can be so unmoved? I mean, how, how, why do we take this obligation so casually? I, I think it's because we're afraid. What are we afraid of? We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of people calling us Holy Joes or Bible thumpers. So, so let's just put this off under the cloak of, of sowing seeds in a really protracted team-building relationship exercise. Again, we're not on the hook for results. Just the telling. I'm telling you, man, I, I believe God has something for us in all of this. He wants more for this body of believers. Look, I, I'm not here to do some kind of a drive-by guilting, all right? I, I'm just not. But I am compelled to challenge us. That this is a great body. This is a great, great body of believers. And, and, and God is, is pouring his word into you and I week in and week out. And man, I, I just know he wants to use us, all of us. There is joy there. There is life to be had. There are lives to be saved. He he doesn't have to use us to do that. Do you understand that? But he does. Why? Because there is joy there. And because the stakes are tremendous. There is a day of judgment coming. And that's what's so interesting about what Christ says here. Now, uh, here you've got these uh, three very pagan cities. You've got Tyre and Sidon, and and you've got Sodom, which most of you know, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. These were all very wicked cities that God had judged in the Old Testament. And yet he says there is a future judgment waiting for them, an eternal judgment. Here's the interesting part. He looks at these three religious cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida and and Capernaum, and he tells these guys that these pagan cities will fare better in the judgment than them. Again, ouch! That's going to leave a mark. We don't know a whole lot about Chorazin and and Bethsaida. We know a little bit more about Bethsaida than Chorazin. But we do know quite a bit about Capernaum, right? Capernaum was the headquarters, the the base of operations for Christ's ministry. And that's why they're sort of uh, singled out here. They had, understand, God in the flesh walking and living among them. What was that like to be living in this first century town at that time? I mean, they had God in the flesh healing everybody. Guys like Luke are going out of business, understand that. And and he's not doing card tricks in people's living rooms, all right? He's raising people from the dead. He's he's putting ears and noses back on lepers. He's, He's giving sight to the blind. I mean, they had God walking in their midst, and yet there was no impact. There was no change of heart. They were turning their back upon the God of the scriptures. So much for signs and wonders. I told you this would be tough stuff. 
The Bible teaches us that where there is privilege, there is responsibility. The more privileged a people are, the privilege of hearing the gospel, of, of having opportunities to know God and, and, and to love God and, and having God come to you and, and pursue you. And, and yet in the face of that privilege, if you turn your back on the God of the Bible, there is going to be a more severe judgment. That's what Christ is saying here. This is tough stuff. Now, the Bible tells us that when we turn our back upon the God of Scripture, that you and I just get real stupid. There's not another way to say it. We, we profess ourselves to be wise, but in reality, we, we just become very, very dumb. Take a look at this. You know the Scripture. For even though, this is out of Romans chapter 1, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or, so they knew God, but they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they, came, they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. Now, you look at our culture, and you try and explain what is going on in any other way than we are becoming increasingly dumber right? I mean, case in point, we refuse to police our southern border in, in any significant way. We don't know who's coming across. We don't know what they're bringing, and quite frankly, we don't care. But if you happen to sell raw milk to your neighbor, we're going to come through your front door with a SWAT team and, and possibly execute the family dog is what we're going to do. We don't want to police our border, but we want to, but, you know, we're going to police the farmer's market. You know, that farmer's market, that's quite a, a threat to our national security, right? How do you explain that other than we are just getting ever dumber with every gen of America, generation of Americans that come along because we are, why, turning our back on the God of the Scriptures. I mean, here we are. We'll send our troops all over the world, and every time we do, we'll, we'll produce bumper stickers, pray for the troops, pray for our sons and daughters, and yet we turn right around and continue to butcher our sons and daughters in the womb. Now, you think about this. If you're an American 25 years old or younger, close to half of your generation did not make it out of the womb alive. Now, you think about that. We have just sacrificed on the altar of convenience a half of generation of Americans. This is what is produced when, as a nation, we continue to turn our back on the God of Scripture. There has never been a more important time to begin to share the truth of Christ with our friends and neighbors in an increasingly darkened world. There has never been a more important time for the gospel to begin to take flight once again in this nation. Let's not play church. Let's be the church. Let's be salt and light in our communities within our spheres of influence. The stakes are tremendous. We don't have all day. And yet, where the gospel takes flight, there is always hope. And we cling to that. And we move forward. To be about, what's the first thing that Christ said recorded in the Gospels? Hey, Amen. I, I am about my Father's business. So here you have Capernaum. They have God living in their midst, and yet they wanted nothing to do with him. And, and consequently, Christ says here, there is going to be a great judgment coming your way. All right, so he sends out the 70. Uh, here now in verse 17, we're going to see they are going to return. And what do you suppose we're going to find them talking about? Well, we're told now, verse 17. A 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I, and this is very interesting, I was, Christ says this, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, now, maybe that sounds like a weird thing to say, but remember that Christ is co-eternal with the Father, all right? He has always existed prior to the incarnation, so it's not so weird when you understand that Christ hails from a place with no time. 
Okay? So he says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Verse 19, behold, that word, very emphatic in the Greek, it means listen up, pay attention. Behold, verse 19, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, this is huge, verse 20, do not rejoice in this. You with me, church? Do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you. So what should we rejoice in? Well, he tells us, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. That word for record there, engrafio, it's where we get our word engraved from. It's there to stay. Now, you remember last week, we talked about one of the uh, impediments to discipleship, one of the impediments to maturing as a Christian, and, and that's digging in your heels on your preconceived ideas. Get that study if you missed it. We had seven impediments to discipleship presented in the text. Here's one of those areas, man, I'd really like to see people get over. It, it, it is horrible theology to have a great big Satan. And there are a lot of Christians and a, a lot of Christian groups that do. They talk a lot about Satan and they're, they're coming against Satan and they're rebuking him and all this goofy business. Maybe it makes them somehow feel spiritual. I, I, I don't know, but biblically it is horrible theology. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer on this again. We, we are not instructed to rebuke him. We're, we're not told to talk to him. James tells us to resist him. So let's put this up again because I would love for all of us to move past this. You submit to God, you resist the enemy, he bugs off, and you move on down the road. Understand that, again, that Satan and his minions are nothing more than pawns in the hand of God. They can do nothing apart from his permission, Job 1.12. And so you don't need to run around with this, any degree of paranoia. Well, you know, you better be careful. Satan's going to get you. You know, no, no. Uh, Linda Blair's not going to pop out of the bush with her head spinning around, all right? That's bad theology. Now, notice Jesus says here, I saw Satan crash and burn. Very interesting thing to say. I, I think there's a couple things going on here. Number, wor- uh, number one, uh, again, behold, verse 19, right? That word, behold, pay attention. Jesus is saying, look, pay attention. I have absolute authority over these idiots. All right, I'm from eternity. I'm from a place with no time. I saw Satan go down in a ball of fire. If I took care of the chief, what are you so worried about the Indians for? They are subject to me. Understand that. Second thing is, and I think there's a a kind of subtle warning in here. I, I, I don't... Not not sure if they're getting it, but there's a warning here. The Word of God tells us what? That pride comes before the fall. Let's take a look at this. That word for haughty. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. My cap's there. That word haughty, it means arrogant. Jesus says here that he saw Satan fall. Now, how, in fact, did Satan fall? Well, the Bible tells us that was pride, right? Right? And so I think the subtle warning here, and and I think what he says in verse 20 really confirms that. I I think the warning is, boys, be be careful that pride doesn't fill your heart. This demon business is not what you should be rejoicing in. You should be rejoicing that you are saved, that your names are in the book of life. And, And I think the very same warning goes out to all of us today, particularly those among us who have a a really big devil. We're talking about a great big Satan all the time. Now, in their defense, in the disciples' defense, we want to stay balanced. They're all excited. We understand that. Who wouldn't be under this kind of an authority from the, from the Lord? But again, Christ's warning in verse 20 is your excitement is directed at the wrong thing, boys. You see, by their words, dial in, by their words, they are showing us what it is that is important to them. Now, what is important to you? The way that you are able to figure out what is important to you is by simply figuring out what it is that you talked about, right? Or what you talk about. 
you think about what you talked about all this past week, and that's going to reveal to you what is important to you. There are people, they, they always want to talk about their kids and what their kids did here and there and, and what my kid has accomplished, and this is the job my son has landed, and hey, awesome, I'm one of those people big time. Other people, they, they, they talk about work, or they talk about sports, but, but it becomes, here's my point, it becomes very clear when you hear people talk, they're telling you what it is that is important to them. The very same thing is true within the four walls of the church. Now, don't we also know Christians that there, man, there, there are certain subjects that they just love to talk about? You know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll talk to people or, or people will call the church and they'll ask me questions. Maybe they're looking for a church home. And, and I, I am fascinated at how few of those questions are about the teaching. Where do you guys land on baptism? Who do you baptize? When do you baptize? How do you baptize? What's the temperature of the water? Or people will say, do you guys speak in tongues? Is there, is there a tongue time? I mean, where do you guys land there? And it, it becomes very clear in just five minutes what it is that is important to them. And even after I've told them what it is that we do, sometimes, man, it's, it, again, it's just BBs off a battleship. There's no penetration there. And so I'll have to say, look, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk here. I, I'm trying to be offensive. But, but, but after hearing you, I, you know, there's a church or two down the street that, that I think would serve your needs better than we would. Now, every once in a while, Christ did say the road was narrow, right? Every once in a while, and I've had this conversation with many of you who are now sitting here, people will say, look, man, I I just want to know God. I want to go deeper. I'm tired of the same topical stuff year after year. I'm tired of this hyper-spiritual sideshow. I I, I just want to know Christ. And with that, I breathe a sigh of relief and can confidently say, I believe that God has led you here. This is where you should be. You can always tell by simply talking to an individual what it is that is important to them. Now, Here these guys are. They have just proclaimed the gospel of salvation. They they have heralded the life-changing message of the kingdom, and all they want to talk about is demons. And Christ is saying here in verse 20, and, and understand the love and the gentleness that we don't have. Christ is saying to these guys, man, look, I love you, man. I, I, I know you're excited. I, 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 I built you. I, I, I know the machinery you're working with here. But you really want to be excited about something, guys. You want to be thrilled about what is going on in your life. Be thrilled about this, that your name is written in the book of life. I'm reminded of what Jude said. Let's take a look at this. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, he's writing to the church here, uh, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mike, let's leave that up there for a minute. Now, we're using the King Jimmy here because it's, it's the only translation in this instance that got the order uh, consistent with the original text. So, notice the verbs. Sanctified, preserved, called. Now, sanctified here. When did God set you apart? When did he choose you? He, he chose you before you were ever born. He, he chose you, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world were ever laid. Ephesians chapter 1. He knew you before you were born. He, he knew you before he knit you together in your mom, right? Jeremiah 1, Psalm 139. And then notice, he preserved us. He kept us. Can you not look back over the course of your life and see the preserving hand of God before you knew him? I I wasn't praying to him. I didn't know him. I certainly wasn't worshiping him. But in, as I go back in my mind, I can see these events, uh, very clear events of his his sovereign protection over me, his keeping, his his preserving hand. I, I see how he was bringing certain individuals into my life. And then I can see he finally brought me to that moment where I was called, where the eyes of my understanding were finally opened, where I was born again and received Christ as both my Lord and Savior. Now, Christ is saying, boys, you want to be excited about something? Be excited about this. 
How excited, would to God that we would be excited that, that God is full of compassion, that he is full of mercy, that God has chosen you, each and every one of you. What, why, what about that reality just seems to get lost on us over time? How is it that the thrill of being chosen by God no longer impacts us, no longer moves us in any way? How is that? And yet Christ is saying that is the chief message of Scripture. God has chosen you. He is crazy in love with you. He has compassion upon you, mercy upon you. He is gentle with you. If you're going to give thanks for anything this week, give thanks for that. When we get together, the single subject that ought to be dominating our conversation as a Christian is just just the mercy and grace of God. Can you believe it? Can you believe the grace of God? Can you believe the mercy of God? God's just been so gentle with me. He's towing the line, and he's done this, and he's done that. And you don't know my past, man. I mean, can you believe how awesome and gentle and loving and powerful our God is? That's what should dominate the conversation of a Christian if that is most important to him or her. Finally, this morning, verse 21. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. This is Christ. Uh, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Now, now, is he rejoicing that smart people aren't coming to Christ? Of course not. 2 Peter 3, 9, right? God desires that all should come to repentance. But, But this is what the 70 saw. The 70 went out, and they didn't see master's students coming to the Lord. Okay? They just saw simple, uneducated people just embracing the message of the gospel. That's what Christ is rejoicing in. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. Verse 22, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. And here it is, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, verse 23, he said privately, and I love this, blessed are the eyes which see the things um, that you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. You know, oftentimes... We think how awesome it might have been to to maybe see Moses split the Red Sea or or, or, or what was it like to be led around by a tornado of fire or or what, I mean, could you imagine being there when Elijah just called the fire down to consume the prophets of Baal? I mean, what, and yet here is Christ saying, no, no, you've actually got this reversed. To know God, to know God and know life through Christ, the fullness of what you and I have available to us is precisely what these saints and prophets of old have longed to experience. It it, it is that which all of their work pointed to, but but they could never quite reach out and grasp it. It was was just outside of their grasp, and yet it is yours and mine for the taking. And and again, we're, we're just so cavalier about that? Do we understand this dispensation in which we live? How remarkably privileged we are. Jesus is telling these guys, he's telling you and me, you count your blessings, man, for they are many and have been desired for centuries on end. Now, notice again here, notice that Christ says that if you know God, you know God because God has revealed it to you. Do we understand that? Do do we understand this great salvation that we have? Do we understand it is based entirely upon the work of Christ? There is no reason at all that we should be going around patting ourselves on the back. Well, look at how holy I am. Look at me and look at all this stuff I do. But rather we should be going around exalting the mighty name of Christ who has saved us. Now, why are we saved? 
Are we saved so we can act like nice church people on Sunday and then just go on our merry way and live like animals Monday through Saturday? No. We are saved that we might learn to grow in our delight in God and that that growing delight within us would produce a, a real desire to then go out and make known whom we've come to know. You are not going to make known that which you do not delight in. We understand that. And so much of what God is doing once we're saved is working in our hearts that we might grow in our delight in him, that we might say like the psalmist, that the cry of our hearts would be his, I delight to do your will, O God. Understand that God is most glorified in you and I when we are most satisfied in him, when we are finding great delight in him. What do you think we're going to be doing for all of eternity? We're going to be delighting in God. If you don't learn to just delight in God, man, man, I'm I'm not sure you're going to like heaven because that's what we're going to be doing there. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about floating around on a cloud with a harp, right? The Word of God, we just don't get this. The Word of God speaks of a a new heaven and a a new earth. There is going to be a, a, a robust flourishing society, bustling with activity. We, we will be learning and growing in the glory of God. And, and there's just this endless reservoir of fascination. And, and yet there's, there's trees and homes and, and rivers and mountains and cities. And, and all of these giftings, all of that, I told you this before, all of these tendencies and interests that, that God has built within you, though they may have been snuffed out by, by the busyness of this world or, or by sin or, or lost opportunities here on earth, in his kingdom, understand you will be operating in the fullness of all those interests and desires that he put in your heart. Take heart that thing that you always wanted to do that got snuffed out. You're going to do that. You're going to operate in what he has drawn and kind of put within you. What a glorious promise. Do we have any idea do we understand that the Bible speaks more, it speaks much more than of a restoration, but in fact, a, a, a consummation of, of all that was meant to be? Now again, when we grow into this kind of understanding and, and appreciate, appreciation of the reality that, that is and is ever before us, what else can you do but desire that, that others would would grab a hold of this and get a hold of this. The love that has been produced in a person's heart that the Lord has brought that far is, as the Apostle Paul said, constrained by the love of Christ, compelled by the love of Christ to go forth and make he and his kingdom known. Now, we're all at different places on this journey We understand that, but man, this is where we're going. This is where it's all going. So if you're a new believer or or you're a believer on kind of the front end of your journey, man, rejoice. This is where you're headed. This is the direction you're going to be moving in. Allow the text to encourage you. Now, if you're a seasoned believer, if, if you've been with the Lord for a number of years, but... The joy, of, the joy of this journey and delight, the, the thrill of the hunt for lost souls, the burden for the lost, if, if these things have left you, if you've somehow got on some other track where you're finding things more important than the moving forward of the kingdom, may I suggest, seasoned believer, that you have lost your seasoning. Allow the text to convict you, not condemn, not condemn. There's no condemnation in Christ, but to lovingly convict and and draw you back and uh, upward and into the great invitation to be a part of God's eternal work once again. Now, this may be tough stuff here, but again, we got to keep framing it and what's at stake, where it's going. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, the prince of preachers, he says this, and we'll close in prayer. When you speak of heaven, let your face light up. Let it be irradiated by a heavenly gleam. 
Let your eyes shine with reflected glory. But when you speak of hell, well, your ordinary face will do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, your word says, to whom much is given, much is required. So here, Father, we have received this great forgiveness, this great mercy and grace, this great privilege of the gospel. Would you now give us the desire to respond to such a great salvation by being about your will? Lord, would you take this broken little family here? God, would you inflame our hearts to now have a desire to reach the lost around us. Lord, we don't want to play church. Would you help us to be the church? Lord, we are seeking to be a part of this very unique community of believers that you've gathered here, that we would be a people growing in our delight in you and that that growing delight would compel us to make known what you are continuing to make known to us. Lord, would you help us this week to just recapture the joy of being saved, to uh, to be moved by what it is you have done for us for all of eternity. God, would you help us? We are a weak and feeble people. We are easily distracted. We can get caught up in so many things and just lose sight of why it is that we are here and what this is all about. So God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your gentleness. Thank you, God, that despite us, you continue to pursue us so relentlessly. Lord, you just keep coming back after us with your great, great love. Would you move in our hearts this week? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.